Good morning. Hospitals and ERs, but first of all, let's take a look at this week on the oldish. We published some great articles this week, and actually, uh, my favorite one may be the one that just got published this morning on music therapy. So that's the only one I want to talk about. It is fascinating. So the article has to do with music therapy used at end of life care. It seems, oh, we probably know this, we've done articles on music before in music therapy, but it seems that when people are reaching the end of their life, music can still reach them when other things cannot reach them. It's astonishing and it's wonderful. And I do hope that if you have somebody who is in uh, hospice care or palliative care, that you are using music as part of their therapeutic programs because it does bring them such joy and peace and it connects them to memories as well. So that is a wonderful article. Um, take a look at that. So we have, um, we have some news from around the world. I guess that as pertains to senior citizens, aging seniors, the flu is hitting seniors everywhere and it is hitting them hard. I know I have a number of friends in my community who have the flu now and most of us got the flu shot. So hopefully what they're saying is true is that even if you got the flu shot and you get the flu, the effects of it are much milder than if you had not taken yourself to the doctor or the pharmacy or wherever and had the flu shot. So let's hope that that's good. But really, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. If you're sneezing, sneeze into your elbow. And if somebody around you is sneezing or coughing and not doing it into their elbow, back away. Back away, because even if, you know, whether you're three feet away from them or six feet, even nine feet, those little molecules can still get you. And another thing you should be doing when you're out in public, if you're touching doorknobs or grocery carts or whatever you're touching, don't then take that hand that you touched it with and touch an orifice. Don't touch your eye, your nose, your mouth, your ear, because that's how those little darling molecules get in and make you sick. So don't touch your, your face anywhere on yourself until you can get home and wash your hands. Okay, that's really important. Wash your hands, have I said it enough? Wash your hands, wash your hands. That's the best combat that you have against these uh, viruses. So governments in Canada and the US are being lobbied about a number of things given, given the fact that we have an aging population in both countries, around, around the world indeed. The new shingles vaccine, Shingrix, Shingrix, which we talked about last week, they're lobbying their governments to pay for that because the efficacy rate is so high, 97%, I believe was the figure that I left. It was either 91 or 97. It's very high and much higher than anything else that's been around for a while. So governments are being lobbied to provide that vaccine for free. You need two shots at, at a predetermined interval. Uh, but it's it's been proven to be very effective. They also want a number of uh, day programs to be created for seniors. So that'd be a really good thing for aging seniors who are in their communities and who are being cared for by caregivers. That'd be a great thing to not only stimulate the seniors with programs like music or exercise, whatever, that they don't get at home, but it would also give the caregiver a bit of a break as well. And that's very important. So watching your community for those kinds of things to come around and Add your name and your voice to the cause. There are an, an increasing number of people advocating in their communities for increased seniors housing. And they're talking about all kinds of things from communal houses to six bed homes and tiny communities. So, you know, you, you definitely want to be thinking ahead for these kinds of advocacy points because in 40 years time, the number of seniors is gonna to start to drop off. 
And then these things will be sitting around like we have so many schools sitting around empty now. So it's good to come up with a program that actually covers all of the possibilities, but we do definitely need places for seniors to be. Uh, in Camden, Maryland, however, they have the opposite program. They have seniors in 20 years. It has six beds and they're having difficulty finding enough residents to fill those beds. So they're closing down. They're closing down because they can't find six residents to fill those beds. Isn't that something? So did you know that there's a, there's a competition? I think it just happens in the, in the States. It's called Future Cities. And students from 11 to 14 participate in this. And one of the challenges for them in the recent competition was to come up with age-friendly ideas for cities. And they came up with a lot of really cool ideas. I'm going to share some of them with you. Homes that downsize themselves. I'm not sure how that happens. I don't know. Does it throw out stuff it hasn't seen you use? Oh, I'm not really sure. Modified sidewalks for people like Jetsons, Batman. Do you remember the Jetsons? They had those moving sidewalks. That's really good. Teleportation and something called NAD plus to reverse aging. Now I had to look that up, NAD plus. It turns out it's an oxidizing agent that accepts electrons from other molecules. If it can reduce aging, I'm there. That's good. Here's something else I'm there for. Free massages for aging seniors with joint pain. Sounds good, huh? Free massages. <laughs> I love this one. Public self-cleaning bathrooms every 500 yards to deal with overactive bladders. Kids 11 to 14 are concerned about overactive bladders. I love it. Self-cleaning bathrooms. They, they had it right down to a science, too, how often these things would clean themselves and, and refresh and so forth. One eighth grader was asked why she wanted to compete. And her response was, if kids aren't thinking about this, who will? After all, it's my future. Way to go, kids. You're the kind of kids I want running the world. That's awesome. Okay, let's talk about hospitals. You know, that's a bit of a serious a bit of a serious thing. We're going to divide that, this into two parts. We're going to talk about the ER and then we're going to talk about the inpatient ward because they, they have two different sets of issues. Let me start out at the beginning by saying that I don't for one moment believe that hospitals, the nurses, the doctors, the dietary staff, the cleaning staff pick a person. I don't believe for one moment that they don't truly care about the patients that are in their ER wards and their inpatient wards. So let's get that straight right off the top. They have a number of challenges. I don't think that caring is one of them. I think they care a lot. And I think that a lot of the stress that, that hospital workers develop is tied to the fact that they care too much. So let's just set that aside and understand that I'm not coming from a place of thinking they don't care. Okay. So ERs, there was a study published in the Annals of Emergency Medicine. It was a small study, it looked at 754 people over a period of 14 years. And these people were all community dwelling seniors. When these people were admitted to the emergency room and sent home, within the next six months, they had a decline in function. So the point of this study was to point out when an aging senior goes to an emergency room, there's often a whole bunch of stuff going on. And their families and caregivers would do well to regard the fact that they went to an emergency room as a red flag, big red flag, okay? So awareness is the first, is the first thing that they need to think about. It would be good also, and we've talked about this before, for the family members to have one of them be there at the hospital for their senior, to be an advocate and to be a set of ears, perhaps a note taker. 
you know, maybe part of the reason that these people are so vulnerable when they go home is because they haven't understood everything that's said to them in the ER. After all, they're, they're probably discombobulated at being at the ER in the first place. And we don't know why these 754 people went to the ER. We don't know if they were having a heart attack, if they were having trouble breathing, if they fell. We, we don't understand the reason. But for sure, an aging senior is likely to be in a confused state and maybe not taking everything in. So their decline in function could be related to the fact that in their treatment, and, and these people were all sent home, by the way. These are not people who were then admitted. They were taken to the ER, they were triaged, they were dealt with, perhaps they were observed for a while, and then they went, then they were sent home. Okay? So the, the ER visit does tend to make them more vulnerable. So when they were sent home, was there a change in their treatment? Was there a change in their medication? And they didn't fully understand? Were they told to follow up with their family doctor and they didn't? Was there medical go get it? Or they did they not understand all of that? So it's really important, I think, for a family member, a neighbor, a close friend, somebody to be with the aging senior when they are taken to the ER. Now we did publish an article, I will point out, uh, quite some time ago about uh, senior friendly ERs being developed more and more. And, and I grant you that this is a function of budget, for sure. But many hospitals are looking at making their ERs more senior friendly. So softer lightning, or lightning, lighting, softer lighting, softer beds, bigger clocks, with hands that can be read more easily by weaker eyes, quieter, just places that reduce the senior. Um, delirium is also a problem with aging seniors. Um, you know, we hear frequently enough about people who are left on gurneys out in the hall they're waiting for a bed, they're waiting for a room, they're just, they're waiting to be dealt with somehow. It's noisy, it's confusing, the lighting is, is just not conducive to rest. And so delirium is something that can easily develop in an aging senior. So, you know, it's, it's really important to identify these seniors at risk. It's really important for family members and caregivers to follow up with seniors who have been to the ER, watch for changes, Watch for a decline in function, and and if you see red flags go up, deal with it sooner rather than later. You know, if they went in because they've had a fall, for instance, falls are are part of my regular day to day world. Um, if if somebody has gone into the hospital because they've had a fall, watch for signs of fearfulness. They may have been taken to the hospital, examined, they had a bit of bruising, and they were sent home. That doesn't mean they're not fearful. And it doesn't matter where the fall happened. It doesn't matter whether it happened out in the community, within their home, in the hospital, um, at their son's house, in the grocery store. It doesn't matter where it happened. It doesn't matter how serious the fall was. It doesn't matter how severe their injuries may or may not have been. A fall is a fall is a fall. And it's a very frightening thing for somebody who's an aging senior. So if you see somebody who has fallen, ending up, with a more sedentary lifestyle, being more fearful, um, those are those are warning flags. They need to get their exercise somehow so that they stay strong and they regain their confidence. So, you know, whatever the reason is that took them to the ER, just watch for changes, okay? Hospitals themselves are a different matter. And again, I'm not coming from a place of hospitals don't care, they do. But a number of people have written on this topic that hospitals are just simply not great for aging seniors. CNN had an article, The Older You Are, The Worse the Hospital it Is For You. Dr. Brian Goldman, who is with uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and he has a show called White Coat Black Art. And he's had numerous um, podcasts and articles on seniors and hospitals. Um, he maintains that frailty is not being recognized. So 
people need to pay attention to frailty. So what is frailty? Let me just find this. Um, frail people, this is an article that was written by Dr. Brian Golden, as a matter of fact. Frail people typically have at least three of five symptoms, and these are not being identified. Unintended weight loss of roughly five kilograms or more within the past year. Tiredness, loss of muscle mass, weakness, walking slowly, and physical inactivity. So these are things that uh, were, are not being identified well. Now, when a senior is admitted to the hospital, they're admitted for something specific, generally speaking. They may have a number of what are referred to as comorbidities. So a bunch of things going on. This might be somebody who has diabetes and or COPD and or a cancer diagnosis and or um, difficulty ambulating. They might be there for, they might have a number of things going on with their bodies. They might have been admitted to hospital because they have pneumonia. That's what the hospital is there to treat, pneumonia. But in the course of treating this pneumonia, a lot of stuff might go on. Their medications might be messed with. They might have antibiotics administered to them that they've never had before. Um, they might be bedridden. And immobilization is like the death. For instance, um, catheters used to be routinely um, put on seniors. So they didn't have to get out of bed and go pee. So I, it could be for any number of reasons. Catheters aren't necessarily the standard of care anymore. Walking programs to keep them strong aren't necessarily part of the treatment plan for a person with pneumonia. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be done. There are a number of things that should be done to maintain the health of seniors. Um, in fact, here's a statistic. Now, this was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Nearly a third of patients over the age of 70, and more than half of those over the age of 85, are discharged from hospital in worse shape than when they were admitted. Can you wrap your head around that? They're discharged in worse shape than when they were admitted. So this, art, this article goes on to say that the hospitals are busy places. And they're busy with things like feeding, bathing, and other things can often fall between the cracks. Wards are noisy. The lights are there. It's difficult for people to rest. Um, it's just, you know, hospital stays end up making people weaker and weaker and weaker and sets up already frail patients for failure. There are two parts to this. Part of it is the family and caregivers. Part of it is the hospital. So let's deal with the hospital first. I can really only speak about the funding for hospitals in Ontario. I'm quite familiar with that. I'm not as familiar with funding models uh, across other parts of Canada and certainly in the US. Hospitals typically are funded by tax dollars. They are given their annual stipend by, in our, in our case in Ontario, the LIN, the Local Health Integrated Network, which takes the money from the government and doles it out to hospitals and long-term care facilities. Okay? The amount of funding that is given to hospitals on an annual basis is increasing by 1% to 2%. At the same time, costs are going up by greater than that, 5%, 7%, 10%. So the expenses are increasing more quickly and, and will probably never be caught up to by the revenue. That doesn't mean in my book that hospitals should do nothing but complain about how little their funding is going up. I actually think that hospitals need to look at doing business differently. I think that they need to figure out how to earn revenue. The world has changed and you can't just expect that tax dollars are going to keep up with your expenditures because the expenditures to a large extent are coming from free business. They're free to raise their prices and they do. 
they raise their prices because they want their wages to go up. They raise their prices because um, their their cost of doing business is going up. Their rent's going up. Their hydro's going up. Um, their employee costs are going up. Their purchasing costs for their own supplies are going up. Everything's going up, and this isn't a free market where this is happening. It's a democratic country. That's allowed to happen. This is what the hospitals are competing with. And hospitals need to figure out a different way of doing business. And that is to say, not petitioning the government for more money because it's all gonna come from the public purse. It's gonna come from my tax dollars. They've gotta look at something different. Business has changed and they need to change their model of doing business. That's my belief. You may have a different take on it, that's my belief, and I talk about it in talks that I give. I talk about it um, in posts that I write. I, I talk to other people about it. I talk about this. The world is changing, and we need to keep up or die. Simple as that. But the other part of this is families who are now more than ever required to be advocates and caregivers for their loved ones within the hospital setting. So if the hospital is not exercising these people all the time, um, then there need to be people there exercising them. And whether that's with, you know, exercise bands or tossing a ball back and forth or getting them up to walk if you're strong enough to, to be able to do that. We have a question coming up here from Heather. Do you have user fees in Ontario? Yes and no. Yes and no. There are some things that are user pay. Um, a hospital stay is generally covered by OHIP, our Ontario Health Insurance Program. Uh, but there are user fees for, for some things. Um, extra, extra things that people want. You know, if you want to stay in a semi-private room and your health insurance doesn't cover it, then you have to pay the difference. If you want to bring in um, a separate therapist, then you have to pay that difference. Uh, the hospital will generally pay for whatever you need while you're in that hospital. The, the medication, the bed, the nursing staff, and so on. I hope that answers your questions. It's, it's very um, item specific. As it is uh, across, now um, Heather, you're from um, Manitoba, and so your system may have a different set of user fees. Alberta may have a different set of, us of user fees, and BC may, and they may in the States too for our American uh, people. Yes, thanks. Okay, good. Excellent. Thanks, Heather. Uh, so we will hide the comment. That's easy. And we'll go back to our let's talk about hospitals. Thanks for watching, by the way, Heather. I do appreciate it. Um, and if you have any opinions on this about frailty or whatever, chime in because I, I, as it happens, I know Heather and I know that she works in hospitals and, and has done for many, many years. So uh, but she's probably rather an expert on this subject. So by all means, chime in if you if you hear something. But anyway, so back to the families. The family they need to, uh, they need to, and I know that it didn't used to be that way, but if we're releasing people back into the community that are more frail than when they came into the hospital, Somebody somewhere has to do something and take responsibility. And I know it's a burden. I know it. It's a burden for the person who's in the hospital too. They don't want to be there. It's not easy to get rest. It's not easy to get great food. Uh, and I, I know that hospitals will often say, oh, sure, we have exercise programs and therapy. Maybe they go once a week. I don't know. Your house, every hospital is going to be different. If they're just going once a week, that's not often enough. People have to be up and ambulating every day multiple times a day if they can do it, you know, get them a walker to stabilize them and walk them up and down the halls, make them do it. If they've got a catheter, ask for the catheter to be removed. And there are so many things about hospitals that are, are troubling. We need to keep hospital stays as short as possible because that is what's best for frail seniors. What is, trending is the fact that seniors go into the hospital, they get whatever it is they went in for fixed, and then they're, they're frail. And maybe they can't go home. Maybe they can't go back to their own homes and they have to go to long-term care. Well, there's a waiting period for long-term care beds as well. So oftentimes the hospital becomes home 
And what happens while they're in the hospital waiting for a long-term care bed? They're becoming more and more frail. They're becoming weaker and weaker and weaker as the days go by because hospitals are not intended to be long-term care facilities. They don't have the entertaining programs, the socialization that can go on, whether they're in the community or in long-term care. That's not what hospitals were made to do. Um, I understand that for those of you who may be working in hospitals and thinking that I am um, ragging on you because people are getting more and more frail. I know what you're there for. You're there to, to fix the pneumonia and then send them home. Totally understand that. Uh, truth, yeah, thanks Heather. Heather's saying truth, yes, truth. We know, we know what hospitals are there for and we know what patients need to accomplish while they're there. We just all need to step up. You know how the old saying that it takes a village to raise a child? People, it takes a village to age a senior. I think that's going to be my new catch line. It takes a village to age a senior. That was never more true than now. We all have to take part. Okay, I'm going to stop. I am going to stop talking about this because I could go on and on forever. It's a subject that is of great interest to me. Let's talk about next week on the oldish because this is an interview that I have been promising to you for quite a while. We are going to have the first in what may end up being a series, but for sure it's gonna be three interviews. Uh, it's not gonna be three consecutive, it's gonna be one in January, one in February. Um, there are going to be separate talks with a fascinating woman by the name of Mara Gordon. Mara is the founder of a company, she has several companies actually, but the founder of a company called Aunt Zelda's. And the subject of our conversation is going to be Medical Cannabis 101. So if you are interested in medical cannabis, you need to show up for this interview. You need to be there, have your questions ready. Um, perhaps we won't get to all of them. We may have to curtail some of them because you may be edging into the subject for our next conversation, but um, be there. We're gonna promote it. Um, as soon as I'm finished this one, I will be allowed to start promoting another one with this software. So I'm gonna do that. Mara is fascinating, you will love her. She is a woman with a lot of experience. She was a process engineer at the start of her career. She's had a, a number of health issues herself, as has her husband. And they have taken their passion for healing, and this is what they're doing with it. And Mara speaks all over the world. She is very well known in the, in the medical cannabis field, and you're going to love her. I swear you're going to love her. So tune in next week to uh, see what's going on with Mara and have your questions ready. If you have curiosity about uh, cannabis medicine, Mara is your girl. So there is our website, theoldish.com. I invite you to go there and read our articles. I invite you to join our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram and Twitter. We're all over the place and you can see various and sundry articles. You can see all of the articles that we write on theoldish.com. You can see uh, a selected uh, group of articles published on Facebook a couple of times a week on Instagram as well. We're on Google Plus too. We're everywhere, people. So until this time next week, I wish you a safe, happy, and healthy week. Be good, be kind to yourselves, and take care of each other. It takes a village to raise a senior. That's my new tagline. Bye, everybody.